Have you ever wondered why farmers, the very people who feed us, can no longer do something as basic as replanting their own seeds? For thousands of years, agriculture depended on this simple cycle. Save the best seeds from this year's harvest, plant them next year, and repeat. It was the foundation of farming, food security, and human civilization itself. But in the last few decades, that age-old rhythm has been broken. Today, in much of the world, reusing seeds isn't just discouraged, it's illegal. Farmers are forced to buy new seeds every year, not because the old ones don't work, but because corporations made it that way. At the center of this story is Monsanto, one of the most controversial companies in modern history. This is the story of how Monsanto rose from a chemical manufacturer to the gatekeeper of the world's food supply, why farmers can't replant their own seeds anymore, and what it means for the future of agriculture, economics, and power itself. Section 1. From Sweeteners to Chemicals to Seeds Monsanto started humbly in 1901 in St. Louis, Missouri. Its founder, John Francis Queenie, was a businessman who named the company after his wife's maiden name. At first, Monsanto wasn't about seeds at all. Its first product was saccharin, an artificial sweetener sold to Coca-Cola. The company then moved into other additives like caffeine and vanillin. By the mid-20th century, Monsanto was no longer a small operation. It had become a chemical giant, supplying everything from plastics to industrial coolants. It produced PCBS, widely used in electronics, and later found to be toxic and carcinogenic. It manufactured DDT, a pesticide hailed as a miracle until it was banned for poisoning ecosystems. During the Vietnam War, Monsanto became infamous as a major supplier of Agent Orange, the defoliant sprayed over jungles that left devastating human and environmental consequences. Scandal after scandal built Monsanto's reputation as a company willing to sell harmful products while downplaying the risks. By the 1980s, lawsuits and bans were piling up. The company faced a choice, keep bleeding money in chemicals or reinvent itself. Monsanto chose reinvention, and that reinvention would change farming forever. Section 2. The Birth of Roundup and Roundup Ready Seeds In the 1970s, Monsanto scientists discovered glyphosate, a chemical that could kill almost any plant by disrupting a crucial biological pathway. They branded it Roundup and marketed it as the ultimate weed killer. Roundup was so effective that farmers embraced it eagerly. It saved time, reduced plowing, and boosted efficiency. But Monsanto wasn't satisfied with just selling herbicide. The problem was that Roundup killed everything, weeds and crops alike. The company's breakthrough came when its scientists genetically engineered crops that were resistant to glyphosate. These became known as Roundup Ready Seeds. Now farmers could spray entire fields with Roundup, wiping out weeds while their soybeans, corn, or cotton survived untouched. It was a game-changer. Yields went up. Labor went down. Monsanto's profits skyrocketed. But there was a catch. Farmers couldn't just buy these seeds once and keep them forever. Monsanto patented the genetic traits inside the seeds and wrote contracts, forbidding farmers from saving or replanting them. Section 3. The Death of Seed Saving Seed saving is as old as farming itself. Farmers in Mesopotamia, China, India, and the Americas all practiced it. A seed wasn't just a commodity, you know, it was heritage. Each generation of farmers saved seeds adapted to their soil, their climate, and their traditions. Monsanto ended this cycle. When farmers purchased Roundup Ready Seeds, they also signed a technology use agreement. By opening the bag, they agreed to its terms. You cannot save these seeds. You cannot replant them. You cannot share them with neighbors. Every growing season, you must buy new seeds. The logic wasn't agricultural, it was financial. Monsanto wanted seeds to work like software licenses, rented, not owned. The company argued that without patent protections, it couldn't recoup the billions spent on research. But in practice, it meant turning something that was once renewable into a permanent revenue stream. And Monsanto didn't just trust farmers to comply, it enforced the rules with an iron fist. Section 4. Monsanto's Investigators and the Culture of Fear In rural America, Monsanto's name became synonymous with intimidation. 
the company hired private investigators and former police officers to track down farmers accused of saving seeds. Planes and helicopters flew over fields looking for signs of unauthorized crops. Farmers received letters demanding full access to their land and business records. Neighbors turned against each other. Monsanto even ran a hotline where farmers could report one another for possible violations. If a patented gene showed up in your field, even by accident through pollen drift, you could be accused of infringement. Lawsuits followed. By the 2000s, Monsanto had sued hundreds of farmers, extracting millions in settlements. Many farmers settled out of court, not because they were guilty, but because they couldn't afford the crushing legal costs of fighting one of the world's most powerful corporations. In some communities, this paranoia tore apart social bonds. Farmers who had worked side by side for generations suddenly saw each other as threats. The seed that once symbolized life and continuity became a legal weapon. Section 5. The Monopoly Effect Why didn't farmers just refuse to use Monsanto's seeds? Because Monsanto created a monopoly. Imagine two neighboring farms. One buys Roundup Ready seeds and sprays Roundup. The other sticks with traditional seeds. When the herbicide drifts, the traditional crops die while the GMO ones survive. The second farmer faces crop loss and has little choice but to adopt Monsanto's system just to stay competitive. Soon, Monsanto controlled over 80% of soybean and corn seeds in the United States. Through acquisitions, it swallowed smaller seed companies, reducing competition and narrowing biodiversity. Crops became more genetically uniform, increasing efficiency but also creating fragility, a system dependent on one company's product. This was not just farming anymore. It was subscription agriculture. Section 6 Global Expansion and the Seed Trap Monsanto's reach extended far beyond the United States. In Argentina and Brazil, GMO soy covered vast landscapes. In India, Monsanto's genetically modified cotton was introduced with promises of higher yields. But seeds were expensive and farmers had to buy them every year. When crops failed, debts piled up. In some regions, this debt crisis fueled waves of farmer suicides, a tragedy tied in part to the costs of patented seeds and chemicals. In Africa, Monsanto launched projects to introduce GMO crops with heavy backing from international donors, sparking debates about sovereignty and food independence. In Europe, resistance was stronger. Many countries banned GMO crops outright, though GMO animal feed still entered through imports. European skepticism wasn't just about health. It was about not letting a single American corporation dictate their food system. Still, Monsanto's model spread across the globe. Seeds that once belonged to farmers now belong to corporations. Section 7. The Financial Empire Monsanto's strategy worked brilliantly as a business. Roundup became the world's most widely used herbicide. Roundup Ready seeds dominated U.S. fields and spread abroad. Farmers' seed costs soared, but so did Monsanto's profits. By the 2000s, the company was pulling in billions annually. The genius of the model was bundling. Sell the seeds and the herbicide together. Farmers who bought Roundup Ready seeds were essentially locked into buying Roundup as well. It was vertical integration of farming inputs, controlling both the seed and the chemical designed to pair with it. Wall Street loved it. Investors saw Monsanto not as a seed company but as a toll collector on agriculture itself. Every planting season was another payday. But as Monsanto's financial empire grew, so did public anger. Section 8. Health Concerns and Lawsuits Monsanto marketed Roundup as safe enough to drink. Ads showed people spraying it in their gardens without worry. But in 2015, an international panel classified glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, as a probable carcinogen. Lawsuits flooded in from farmers and gardeners who developed cancers like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma after years of using the product. Internal documents later revealed that Monsanto had ghostwritten scientific studies, influenced regulators, and worked aggressively to downplay health risks. These revelations, known as the Monsanto Papers, destroyed public trust. Juries awarded billions in damages to cancer victims. 
In 2018, German giant Bayer acquired Monsanto for $63 billion. But instead of shedding the Monsanto image, Bayer inherited its liabilities. The acquisition is now considered one of the worst in corporate history, costing Bayer tens of billions in settlements. Section 9. Seeds as Intellectual Property At the heart of this story is a radical shift. Seeds became intellectual property. Just as you can't copy a Disney movie or a Microsoft program without violating copyright, you can't replant a patented seed without violating Monsanto's patents. This raises a fundamental question. Should life itself be owned? Monsanto argued that without patents, there would be no innovation. Critics argue that innovation doesn't justify monopolizing the basis of food. The debate isn't about science alone, it's about ethics, law, and economics. Section 10. The Bigger Picture The consequences go beyond farming. By turning seeds into corporate property, Monsanto reshaped the global food chain. Farmers became customers locked into yearly purchases. Local seed diversity declined, replaced by uniform patented strains. Food systems became more efficient but also more vulnerable to shocks. Non-GMO and organic foods survived as premium niches, often costing more, while the baseline global diet became intertwined with Monsanto's system. Nations dependent on imports found themselves indirectly tied to Monsanto's dominance. And in the process, farming, once a cycle of life passed down for generations, became a subscription service controlled by corporate contracts. So why can't farmers replant their own seeds? It's not because the seeds won't grow. It's not because of nature. It's because one company figured out how to turn seeds into intellectual property, how to bundle them with chemicals, how to enforce contracts with investigators and lawsuits, and how to build a monopoly over the foundation of our food. For thousands of years, seeds were life itself. Monsanto turned them into assets. Whether you see that as innovation or exploitation, one fact is clear. Farming will never be the same. And as the world wrestles with questions of food security, climate change, and corporate power, the fight over seeds is more than a farming issue. It's a fight over who owns the future of food. If you made it till here, subscribe to this channel to support us and see you on the next video.